Hi, everyone. This is Grandmaster Damien Lemos here for iChess.net. Welcome to this webinar. Um, I'm here to promote my player's manifesto. Um, I'll, I'll check whether you can hear me or not. Let me share my, my screen. In the chat, please uh, tell me whether you can hear me or not. And okay, let's let, let's check. Okay, so we got some people. All right, cool. Let's, uh, where were we? Just right here. And the chat was there. All right, cool. Okay, awesome. We are ready to start. Okay, hello, everyone. Yeah, I see your messages. Feel free to chat to, to ask questions. As I was saying, um, I'm Grandmaster Daniel Lemos. Let's restart a bit. Um, I'm here to promote my course, Grandmaster's Manifesto. And let me tell you, this is uh, one of my best selling courses. And I'm not surprised because I put a lot of effort into it. Um, I started playing chess when I was 10 and I got my Grandmaster title when I was 18. I got to tell you, I learned the hard way. I had no coaches, no real guidance. I I learned all I know by myself and by making mistakes and correcting them. So, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, as, as you can see on my screen, um, I'll analyze a game of mine. And this is, this is against... Uh, Dimitri Andrekin, if you don't know him, he's uh, one of the top players out there. So I'll share this game and I'll try teaching and analyzing with my thinking process. Uh, okay, yeah, thanks for that comment, Costas. Uh, hopefully you love this one too. Um, let, let's get started. Um, I was playing white with Naira free. And believe it or not, the first move does matter a lot. I mean, you can play e4, d4. I'll explain why I played this move to begin with. My opponent, who's a top grandmaster, he plays a lot of defenses against d4. Four. It's like it is tough to prepare. So. I decided to start with knight f3 because this is flexible. Probably know you you guys probably know the king's indian attack and what I like about this line is that we know where our pieces are going and with black plays against it doesn't really matter our plan remains the same. So that is why I chose this move knight f3. My opponent gets tricky from the beginning with this move as well. I mean, he's not playing d5, he's not playing knight f6, the usual moves in this position, even c5, and we transpose to a Sicilian with e4. He plays this. And again, I have uh, to decide when in I want to play. I can play in English, c4, I can play a d4 game if I play this move. I can play e4. This is actually what I played. I played this because when he plays this move, he's already showing me his cards. Now I know it's going to be a modern or a pyrrhic defense. Uh, hi, hi, Jacob. How are you doing, buddy? Um, so, yeah, here we have a pyrrhic and Honestly, I like playing against the Pyrrhic, and that is why I play an e4 game now with this move. Okay, he plays bishop here, or, and he plays d6. 
here I have a decision to make as white, um, whether to play a positional game or an attacking one. And my style tends to be positional, but it also depends on, on what opening I'm playing. For instance, let, let me show you from the beginning. A, something like this, okay, E4, bishop here. Suppose I start with E4, I'll make this easier for you. This, D4, bishop G7, this is another move order. Knight C3, D6. Here, if I play with knight of three, bishop e2, kingside castle, this would be a positional line. Same as this, doing the fianchetto. As you'll see, my course will analyze a lot of games where white does the fianchetto. It is a nice positional system, and we also offer our king extra protection. So those are positional lines. But if I want to go for an attacking game, I can play with f3, bishop b3, queen d2, queenside castle. You probably know this setup, and we call this the English attack. It usually works against Sicilian. It is played against that Sicilian, but we can also try it against the Pyrrhic. In my game, I have my knight on f3 already, so I'll most likely play a positional line, and I play bishop c4. Like this, we are hitting his weakest pawn, and of course, if he plays a move like this, we already have tricks. Bishop takes f7, king takes knight here, and then we simply win a pawn, not to mention his king is way too weak. Okay, bishop c4, uh, my opponent plays knight f6, developing the knight, attacking the e4 pawn, also preparing to castle. As you can see, black is following the opening fundamentals. Um, as I always say in most of my courses, when you're playing your black don't go crazy in the opening. Just try getting your pieces out, castle, and then once you have a middle game and a solid foundation, then you go for material. It's playing solid with knight f6 and queen e2. Not the only move. I mean, we can also protect the e4 pawn by playing knight c3 or even knight bd2. Let me explain why I played queen e2. I want to be flexible. If I play knight bd2, bishop on c1 is stuck. So it's not a huge deal, but I think uh, it is much better to play queen e2, then my bishop goes out, and then I play knight bd2. The other scenario would be playing knight c3, protecting the e4 pawn, but then I cannot play the idea I played in the game. As you'll see in the game, I end up putting a pawn on c3. The purpose of doing this is to block uh, that uh, bishop's diagonal. And, well, that, that is an advantage already. That talks for itself. Maybe, and I, I think this would be played by aggressive players, I can try e5. Attacking the knight on f6, also forgetting about this issue. If he takes, I can play knight takes e5, he castles. And the problem of this uh, is that he's likely to continue with the move line knight bd7, and he's proposing a lot of trades already. When we play white, we want to play for the advantage and trades uh, to equality. Not to mention, we lost our center, and he can also play something like c5. So I think queen e2 is a huge decision already. It looks easy, but it's not, it's not that easy. OK, queen e2. The next surprise may be c6. A um, lot of players, including myself, 
I don't know this position, I would castle without thinking much. And this is possible, but c6 is even better. Why? Because it has a positional threat. That is something I discuss a lot in my course. Uh, usually tactics, you can see when a threat is coming because it's like math, you calculate. A positional threat is not that obvious. It's like in between moves. They are easy to miss. So c6 here, if we castle, black has a great move. Maybe you can try guessing this move. Feel free to participate in the chat. What can black play if we castle? Is there any trick, any tactics? Feel free to comment. Okay, hopefully we have some guests. Otherwise, I'll, I'll tell what I think. Once we castle here, first, Black, if he wants, he can play a move like d5. That is uh, the logical continuation, the logical follow-up when he plays c6. OK, yeah, now I start. Capablanca says, well, he would have played knight takes e4. I'm sure about that. So yeah, your guess is correct. d5, yeah, this is the first move. Uh, we are analyzing. This is good too. The thing is, he's attacking our bishop. He's also attacking our pawn. We have to take. I mean, we cannot afford playing a move like bishop b3 because we lose a pawn. Bishop d3, it is possible, but then look at this. He takes our bishop on e4. This, this remains equal, but he, he's got something that I like a lot in open positions, he's got the bishop there. So d5, it is possible we should take as white. Then he's likely to take with the c-pawn. He can also take with the knight, but if I have the chance to bring a side pawn to the center, I'll do it. And we lost our space advantage because the e4-pawn is gone. So as you guys say, yeah, b5 is possible. If we castle, knight takes e4 is even better because then he also trades, not to mention he gets the bishop pair. Maybe before playing queen takes e4, white has an in-between move in this position. I mean, I think black remains better, but if we gotta lose our bishop, then at least let's play bishop takes f7. He has to take, I play queen takes e4. And yeah, despite having a weak king, he plays bishop f5. He can fix this situation. I mean, he can castle by hand too, like queen e2, rook f8. He plays this. Sooner or later, he'll open that position with e5 or c5. We don't need to calculate all this. Just by looking at that position, by looking at those bishops, we realize he has to be better. So as, as you can see, chess is about intuition as well. So if we want to stop knight takes e4, we have to move our bishop. And that's what I did. I played bishop to b3. Now, of course, knight takes e4. I just take it. And if he plays d5, that's not a big deal for us because the bishop is not hanging anymore. And we play e5. The situation, uh, he loses the kingside defender. This is like a rule I learned a long time ago. If I have the chance of playing e5, removing that knight from defense, I'll do it. Uh, not to mention, once he moves the knight, suppose he plays this. Now I have e6, so suppose he plays knight here. We also have extra chances since this knight uh, on f6 is gone. We can play h4, h5. 
we can try dominating on dark squares. Having a pawn on e5 usually means you have great attacking chances. And attacking play initiative, uh, that's another topic we discuss in my club players manifesto. For those who are joining now, um, we are promoting this course. If you want to know more information, just click on the link below this video. So, okay, let's continue analyzing this game. So, okay, knight f6, queen e2, c6. Again, that positional threat, knight takes e4, bishop b3, and now black castles. We play d5, again, we play e5, and we have a great game. Even when I have my rook on h1, I can consider like leaving my king on e1, castle queen side, and then I attack on the king side. But here, he castles, I castle as well. Now it would be different. If he plays d5 now, I still have great attacking chances, but I don't think I'll fire like this. I could, but I think it's even better if I have my rook on h1. So each position is different. Each move we make changes the ideas. OK, thanks for that comment. Yeah. Yeah, I'm paying attention to the chat just in case if you want to say something, ask questions, whatever, feel free to do so. So, OK, I castle. Then my opponent plays this move, this pin. As usual, pins are annoying here. We are glad he has the fianchetto. And why I say this? Because when someone pins you like this and they have the fianchetto as well, they don't have squares to go back. I mean, if he plays bishop h5, I can just trap his bishop by means of g4. So this move, just played is is a bit tricky. That being said, um, for those who play French, Karokan, Slav, when you play as black, you have a lot of openings where bishop c8 suffers. What I'm trying to say is it's not easy to find a good square for this bishop. Um, okay, I see Capablanca says, your opponents, you mean your opponents play this as black? The Pirk is played a lot at all levels. I mean, basically, you can play all the openings out there. You won't lose in the opening. What really matters is once you get a good position to start playing great moves in the middle game. That is what makes a difference. So, yeah, my opponent plays this. As I was saying, black has issues trying to find a good square for this bishop. So, I mean, if he tries something like b6, bishop b7, that's definitely too slow. Maybe b6 and bishop a6, that makes more sense. But in that scenario, I would play something like rook e1. And we can see black is lacking space too. Here is like... A rule when you're lacking space, trade pieces off. That is the best way of dealing with lacking space. On the other hand, if you have more space, don't trade. So, okay, bishop g4, he wants to play knight bd7, and as you can see, the bishop is no longer locked on c8. And I play this move. Not uh, the most logical one, I mean, h3 is like the easy move, the straightforward move. Then he takes, queen takes, and okay, my queen is not bad here, but I prefer having a knight on f3. I always, always insist with this concept. I like having my defender on the king side, and that is why I play this move. I know he'll take on f3 sooner or later. It's like he's not playing bishop h5. 
I mean, if he plays the natural move, knight bd7, trying to play this, I play h3. He's not playing this move. I know he's taking sooner or later. Then I have my knight on d2, ready to retake on f3. So knight bd2, another positional move, in between move, before playing h3, my opponent plays a5. As you can see, he doesn't want to play with knight bd7. Maybe he wants to play knight a6, which is another way of playing in the pirk. But first, he gains some queenside space. And I love this approach because even if this is not entirely correct, it is good to create threats and have the initiative. Chess is a game of initiative. Um, have to create those uh, situations where your opponent is likely to make a mistake. Here, for instance, a5, if I don't play good as white, I may uh, fall in a bad position. So a5, well, as you can see, as you probably know, black has a threat, which is trapping my bishop. And I have like three or four moves to, to avoid this. But knowing which one is best, that's another story. During this game, uh, I thought about a3, playing a3, playing a4, which eventually I, I played, c3. c4 is another option. So let's, uh, I I'll tell you how I thought. c4, my bishop has a way back home, but the main issue is my d4 pawn is not protected. I mean, imagine that knight on f6 was gone for some reason. Then bishop takes e4. He would be winning a pawn already. So c4 also blocks my bishop. It's like I don't win much. I know I have these squares, but it's not compensating, to be honest. c3, yeah, I thought about this move too, as uh, dc Capablanca says. I thought about this. But then I realized I allow a4. Yes, my bishop is not getting trapped, but he wins a lot of space. Maybe he can even play a3. And yes, he loses a pawn, but that diagonal is way too open. If I take, as you can see, my queen side is destroyed. My pawn structure is not healthy anymore. Queen a5. I mean, he also wins. I mean, he wins space and he wins initiative. That is what we are not trying to allow. Maybe a3 is a better option because after a4, I played this. Now he cannot advance. Regarding this diagonal, I can still play c3. That's not all. I can play c3 and bishop b1. One day I can think about the kingside attack. So hey, I see Ali, you say a5. Yeah, this is what uh, my opponent played. Uh, maybe you're talking about a4. And this is the move I played. And I think it's the easiest solution. We play a4 now. He cannot play a4 himself. He cannot play b5. And even if he could, I mean, I control that square. And why a4? Because then c3 is still possible. My bishop goes to c2. Very simple. And then my knight, I have... Let me fix these arrows. My knight has potential via c4. When he played a5, and this is a long-term idea, the b6 square is a hole. I can try knight c4. Probably something like bishop b3. I mean, all these details, they count in the long term, in the long run. So, okay, a a5, I play a4. And then my opponent plays d5. I think this was uh, a risky decision by him. But uh, 
In chess, we have what we call the practice point of view. And that is another topic I discuss in my course, um, my club players manifesto. Um, I talk about end games, middle game decisions, uh, initiative. Here, for instance, um, D5. I know my opponent knows this is not the best move, but he's trying to create some unbalanced position. If he played something like knight vd7 or knight a6, yeah, as you say, Costas, that's right. Uh, b5 loses a pawn. Um, if he plays that, it's because he wants to play some kind of gambit. But if he plays knight vd7 or knight a6, I was going to play this, bishop takes, knight takes, say he plays e5, I can take, take, I can play something like this. And we have a symmetrical pawn structure. It's like that position looks pretty equal. But the only difference is white has the bishop pair. And we know the bishop pair is uh, a nice advantage to have in an open position. So my opponent knew in this position there's almost no risk for white. So instead of playing the actual best variation, which is knight bd7, he plays d5. We said this is risky. Why? Because white advances with e5. I played this almost on the spot because I didn't want to trade pieces. Despite playing against at 2700, um, I don't want to play for a draw. I mean, as white, even as black, I mean, you have to play for a win, play the best move in that position. And taking on d5, this actually fixes most of his problems. He can take with a pawn. Now the c6 square is free for his knight. So e5 is much, much better. If we play anything else, he'll trade pieces on e4. And as we know, trading pieces off can only favor black. So we go for it, e5. And he plays knight f7. Uh, during the game, I thought maybe knight e8 was possible. Chess is a game of a lot of maneuvers. Maybe he can drive the knight to e6. And if he had the knight here, well, it's not the same as having the knight on f6, but on e6, he's somehow defending the king side. So I thought knight e8 was an option. He played knight fd7. Now I play h3. Another move I played instantly because. Uh, in third, I get the bishop pair, and second, my king has some space for the end game. It is always good to play a move like h3. We know that. So knight takes f3, and my opponent goes e6. So think about this. He played bishop g4, he took our knight on f3, and then he places every single pawn with the exception of a5. All of his pawns are on light squares. And if he still had the bishop on c8, that bishop would be terrible because it is crashing into the entire pawn chain. Now, after he played bishop takes f3, he can play with this pawn chain. As you can see, bishop g7 happens to be his best bishop. We play c3. Pawn chains is also something we discuss a lot in our courses. Um, if you study pawn chains, it's like you can handle every single opening out there because openings and defenses are based on pawn chains. Here, for instance, I play c3 and I make sure my center is stable enough to attack later. Uh, I'll play some random moves to explain. So, suppose I play king h1. Then he'll start fighting with c5, knight c6, 
for some reason, my pawn is no longer on d4, that means my e5 pawn is going to be weak. So it's always good to have uh, a move like c3 in because if he takes, I'm ready to retake with my pawn, thus protecting the e5 pawn. So yeah, knight takes f3, e6. Okay, uh, I play c3 and my opponent plays c5. Black, he needs to develop some sort of initiative on the queen side before he gets um, overplayed on the king side. And why I say that? Because on the king side, he doesn't have many chances. That defender is gone. His bishop, despite being his best bishop, is closed. It is on a closed diagonal. And we have great attacking chances. My bishop is arriving soon. You can still play h4, h5. Okay, let's see the plan. Ali says, okay, king h2, rook h1. Well, that plan, which looks like a plan we use a lot in blitz games, that could be considered too. Um, maybe it looks a bit slow to play king here, rook h1, because then I have to play king g1, but it is possible. Maybe if I want to play a plan like that, I would play this, I would fianchetto my king, that's not a risk because he doesn't have the light squared bishop. And then, and then I would play something like this. It's uh, the same plan you are saying, Ali, but it's like an improved version. And by playing this move, g3, it's like I also support h4. Yes, I would consider driving my rook to h1. After all, since the knight on f6 is gone, my interest is to open the h file. It would be tough to do so if the knight was still on f6. So, okay, c3. As I was saying, my opponent tries creating some kind of counterplay because if he stays passive, we'll play the plan we just said. So he plays c5. And he wants to open that position. Yeah, I'm I'm paying attention to the chat. Uh, feel free to um, analyze, to say moves, ask questions, whatever you want. Uh, as uh, okay, as Samo says, yeah, bishop c2, queen d3, and then trying to open that diagonal. Yeah, that's a battery. That that is an attacking concept. Uh, suppose. Well, he played c5, and by the way, now queen d3, he's got c4. But um, we can try, suppose he plays knight a6. This battery, I like it. And now you say this, I have another concept to share. Uh, if you were black, if you were, were black in this position, would you consider a move like f6? Because when you face all these threats, when you see your opponent is attacking too much, you consider playing this move, like getting some kingside space. But um, does this move have an issue? What do you think? F6, black opens the kingside, tries challenging the e5 pawn, the pawn that gives white all the space. Is this possible? Let's see. White first he can take. And this is open in that position. That is the first point. F6 is favoring white's bishop pair. Second, our e6 pawn is now on a tough spot because it is backwards, cannot be protected by other pawns. And yeah, not to mention he's got this move winning this change. Yeah. That's right, as chess philosopher says, f6 is a huge positional mistake to say the truth. Maybe I can play queen takes. And if black somehow plays a quick e5, then his f6 idea was good. But the problem is, White will never allow that. He'll play rookie one. He'll 
plays all his pieces on the E file. He can even he's doubled up now, but he can able he can even triple up there with rook e2, rook a, e1, bishop here. And even if we manage to protect this e6 pawn, black is playing way too passive. So this is not what black is looking for. And he's trying to do something like f6, but he does that on the queen side by playing c5. And OK, here, probably the biggest decision I, I made in this game, after c5, um, should I take or not? That was my biggest uh, concern during this game. Uh, usually, we don't like taking because, as we said, e5 becomes weak. Not to mention he can take the c5 pawn, but the real problem is my e5 pawn not being protected by d4. But I also thought that if I play another move, say bishop here, king h1, he can play knight c6. Let's say I play this. He can take, well, if I take with the knight, I lose my e5 pawn. And losing that pawn is like losing the game because my center is over. I'm down material-wise. If I take with the c pawn, the problem is now this square is available for black, not to mention queen b6. It's like he got what he wanted, a queen side attack. Um, so believe it or not, this is happening because I played a4 a couple of moves ago. If I had my pawn on a3, then I think white is clearly better. But since I have the pawn on a4, these knights, they have a lot of holes in that position. He can also try exploiting the c4 square, playing rook c8, knight b6. I don't know. I feel my king side attack is kind of slow, whereas his queen side attack is already there. So after thinking for a long time, I took on c5. And I reached that conclusion, taking his best, because if he plays knight c6, which is what he, what he played, I can play bishop f4 and then rook e1. Not defending e5 with pawns, but OK, I'm doing so with pieces. And as long as I keep my pawn on e5, I'll keep my space advantage. And if he wants to take on c5, I can already hide my bishop on c2. I keep my bishop pair. This knight is under control. Every single square is controlled by my bishop. And this reminds me of the plan who Samo said. Yeah, trying to play queen d3. Unfortunately, I cannot play queen d3, but I can try driving my queen to the king's side by means of queen e3, and hopefully something like this, or even queen e3 plus bishop h6. OK. Um, in the game, yeah, knight c6, I played bishop f4. My opponent didn't take on c5 yet. He played queen c7, another in-between move. Chess is full of in-between moves, by the way. We play rook f e1, which is, yeah, the best way of protecting the e5 pawn. Maybe you think about rook a e1, but then my rook on f1 is uh, stuck there. I, I don't see any way of improving it. And I don't see myself advancing my f pawn soon. So it is much, much better to play rook f e1. And then the other rook is likely to go to d1. OK, my opponent plays knight takes c5. I play bishop c2. As you can see, this is straightforward logic. I wouldn't say forced, but looks like it. Bishop c2. And OK, this reminds me of the previous position we saw where I had the pawn on d4. But the main difference is. I got these squares under control. 
That is why I made uh, that decision of taking on c5. Okay, bishop c2. My opponent now decides to play f6. And as we discussed before, this rupture is risky because of the e6 pawn. Once he plays f6, the e6 pawn becomes weak. But um, I have to say, f6 is kind of an only move in this position. Uh, let me explain why. Now, when he plays f6, my bishop on f4 is hanging. If he plays a random move like b6 or anything else, I can play this, I can play bishop h2, I can even play a move like this, or queen e3. All of these moves are protecting the bishop on f4, thus stopping the f6 reaction. If he cannot play f6 in the future, that means I have a lot of attacking chances. I can even consider driving my knight to f6, advancing with h4, h5, have a lot of potential attacking ideas. So if he wants to open the king side somehow, he has to play f6 now because bishop f4 is hanging. Okay, after f6, we cannot play much. I mean, we have to take, otherwise, he simply takes the e5 pawn. So I take. We lose the bishop on f4, but he also loses his counterpart on g7. And then he plays king takes. In this position, I remember my opponent was thinking for some time. And I was wondering, what else can he play? Because this king takes pawn is like the obvious retake. But um, this pawn, that being said, this pawn can be taken anytime. He can also play rook f6, for instance. Then he takes and then he triples up on the f file. That's an option. I think it leads to the same position. I mean, he can take first and then he plays this. So king takes. And here I made probably the first uh, mistake, the first real mistake in the game. I play queen b5, which is over ambitious. And yes, I'm attacking the knight on c5. I'm attacking the b7 pawn. But uh, as, as we'll see, this is a mistake. But first, let me tell you, here without calculating much, we have a simple move to get a clear advantage. And that move is developing our rook. Oh, oh yes, that's why, yeah, because my software is in Spanish. So it's like King, it's Ray in, in Spanish. Yeah, it's another language. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, it's like chess base in Spanish, so that's that's why. Um, otherwise, it would be like rook takes, yeah. So, okay, yeah, king takes will change language soon. I didn't know you, you can see notation, uh, so I thought the chess board was being um, broadcasted. So, okay, king takes, um, as I was saying, rook 81 is very simple and enough to get a clear advantage. My opponent, an elite player, took some risks and he's got some weaknesses. And by simple means, I could get the advantage because now e6 is weak, so is d5. My bishop is way much better than his knight. And even if he doubles up on the f file, I'm too solid. My knight on f3 cannot be pushed back. So rook ad1 was very good. I'm, uh, I regret not playing this move. I saw it during the game, but I thought queen b5 was better. Let me tell you what I saw when I played queen b5. Well, of course, I saw b7 is somehow hanging. Queen takes e5, obviously. I saw queen d6, which is the move that he played. And then I thought... 
a move like this or even knight d4. Knight d4 is tricky because um, if he takes, I take, and then as you can see, he loses a pawn. If he plays anything else, I'm going to play a bad move, but just to show you, if he plays rook f7, I had a simple threat, which is queen takes c5, and then I win a piece. This is what I saw, but yeah. It is too obvious black was not falling in this variation. Um, so knight takes d4, pawn takes, I win a pawn. If he plays a simple move uh, like rook f7, I play queen takes e5. This is the move I didn't see, rook f6. Protecting the e6 pawn, b7 is well protected as well. And then he's ready to fire with rook a f8. So after playing queen b5, I realized that was a mistake because he plays queen d6 and my knight d4 is not working. He simply plays rook f6. So I decided to play queen e2. Come back with the queen. It looks like I'm trying to make a draw, but that, that was not the case. Uh, I was expecting my opponent to repeat. And then instead of this, I was playing rook a d1. And then I keep my advantage. But my opponent, who's a smart guy, that's why he has 2700, doesn't play queen f4. He played rook f6. And it's like we reach the same position with an extra tempi for black. Now he'll play rook a f8. And yeah, despite not having the bishop pair, he's got some attacking chances. Um, Ali, you say before, uh, I guess you're saying this for white, right? I mean, here, queen b5, queen d6, maybe b4 in this position. That is the only b4 I see available. Um, it is possible. Yeah, I, I remember analyzing this during the game, and then I take on b7. But first, uh, I'm not sure he has to take. Maybe he can play knight d7. When we take on b7, our queen gets trapped. And if I don't take, if I play something else, then I'm afraid of uh, black taking on b4. Suppose we play rook a1, this, this. And at some point, and I was smelling this during the game, sacrifice, a positional sacrifice, like rook takes f3. That would be devastating because my king is way too open and suddenly his knights, they start entering that position. So I was concerned about this. I have some holes on the king side as well. So I saw before. For some reason, yeah, I decided it was way too risky. So, okay, queen b5, queen d6. I decided to play queen e2. Rook f6, and then after rook f6, I know his plan. Usually, it is good to play if you know what's your opponent going to do. And here it's easy to, uh, to know that black is going to play rook a, f8, and if he's allowed, he's going to sacrifice on f3. So knowing this, I started to prepare the closing of the f file. I think that is the best way to say it. And I start with this move. Because if he plays rook a f8, worst scenario, I can play f3. And then the f file is super solid. Maybe rook f1 if required. So now I play knight e5. And I remember saying not to trade trade too much, but here it is different. He's got a lot of weaknesses to begin with. e6 is weak, so is d5. If we trade pieces, we'll reach an endgame. And we know bishops are better than knights in endgames. So if he trades everything off this endgame, I feel it is much better for us. 
we can double up on the e file one day we'll play b4 knight has to move and e6 is super weak so we're looking to trade pieces off that's why i play knight e5 my opponent doesn't trade since he's lacking bishops since he doesn't want to play an endgame he keeps as many pieces as possible on board playing rook a f8 and yeah i could have played f3 here that was my first option but i decided to play this aggressive move this is an initiative move as well because i protect f2 i attack his rook on f6 and if i have the chance i'll play queen e3 this is tempting as well if i drive my queen to h6 i mean suppose he plays this i can try queen h6 suddenly i see some sacrifices this is great for us but my opponent played rook f4 and the tension here because it is super easy to make a mistake as white uh, rook f4 we see the rook is trying to get some counter play he's been active and it's also a trap because you're probably thinking about a move like this i did during the game i considered this move like pushing the rook back if he plays rook here even if he plays rook here i can play queen d2 and then i enter his position but if i play this move black has a nice resource you shouldn't be surprised that uh, he, he's got a resource because he has a lot of attacking pieces and after this he has rook takes pawn and now we are in trouble he wins a pawn if we play queen takes rook takes here he's got the queen for two rooks and an extra pawn I feel black is much, much better. So she free, rook takes pawn. Yeah, you're probably saying we take with the knight. Yes, but then queen takes, and here we are in bad shape if this rook takes and then he mates us. And king f1, this was uh, the main variation, and this is what I saw during the game. Queen takes h3. King here is got at least a perpetual with queen here. King f1. And I saw this during the game. I was lucky enough to see this. At first, I wouldn't enter this variation because of the drawing possibilities. But black has an in between move before checking on h3. Rook here. We don't have queen e5 check. At this point, we would love trading queens off because we have an extra rook. He simply plays this move and he's got a simple threat. We cannot move much. Let's say we play rook ad1. Now he checks. After this, he mates us. So, yeah, we are in terrible shape after rook f3 because we cannot move our pieces much and despite having extra material we are too passive our extra material is actually sleeping on a1 so this was uh, a tough decision when he played rook f4 uh, this believe me this move uh, i think a lot of good players even good players would fall into this trap and that is why this guy playing black is 2700. Apart from playing great moves and being a strong player, he creates situations where the opponent is likely to make mistakes. And I was about to play that move too. Uh, I was lucky enough to play the super solid F3. Now, the sacrifices are not working. It is quite different if queen here, I have queen g2 and I'm absolutely winning. So I played F3. Now I'm 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 safe after this move. 
He continues fighting with h5. I played knight f2. I'm super solid. And now, even if he attacks, he's not likely to succeed because uh, we have a solid foundation and we are just one move away from finishing our development. Also, when he plays f5, he's creating a lot of weaknesses around his king. So if you have a position like this as black, be careful be before advancing too much, especially if your king is there. In pawns, they don't go back, so h5 is a risky move. Okay, I play this. He plays rook c4. Another tricky move. The rook there cannot be attacked. Maybe he wants to play something like this. I played rook a d1 with a nice threat of queen takes c4, winning a rook. Queen here, and again, uh, he looks like he's attacking, but doesn't have any threats, really. And since he's got weaknesses, that is a fact, uh, I tried entering an endgame. And that is why I played knight d3. The more I trade, the better. He plays rook f6, trying to keep things under control, especially if knight c5 is gone. So I take, rook takes, and I play bishop d3. Now the rook is a bit trapped. When I play bishop d3, I also stop the rook coming back to the king side. And I improve my bishop. So bishop d3, b6, I played bishop b5, knight d8. This position, to be honest, I feel I was better. Uh, for some reason, those weaknesses are not uh, enough. Uh, they are weak, but he can handle them. And I played queen f2. I thought that if I trade queens off, the endgame with the better pawn structure plus my bishop, uh, I thought that was giving me great winning chances, but my opponent took, and he plays knight b7. Black got equality here because he found a nice way of improving his knight. Five, he plays knight d6, bishop d3, knight f7. I play rook e2, and then he played h4. It was surprised because after this move, my opponent offered a draw. Um, we were at move uh, 35, and time control was at move 40. And I was low on time after thinking for five minutes, I accepted. But um, looking at that position, I don't really think white is much, much better. I don't understand why he offered a draw with h4. I know e6 is weak, but after a move like this, he, he can even play rook c6. One day he can try placing his pawns on dark squares and it would be nice for black to one day think about placing his knight on f4 i mean once he fixes the pawn structure like this these pawns are not that great our bishop is crashing into this pawn structure so he could try dominating on dark squares because our dark squares bishop is missing uh, apart from that, I think white, he can try one day playing b4 and try creating a passer on the queen side. I mean, after h4, which is what he played, and the game ends here, I get the feeling this is equal. If we check this with that computer, it also says uh, chances are equal, so I think the result is just fine. And by the time this game was played, like six months ago, um, that was pretty good for me because I wasn't playing much uh, live chess and playing against a 2700 and getting a nice position and a draw was very good for my confidence as well. So, yeah, that was the game. A lot of things to analyze. 
uh, I always like analyzing my own games because I can share my thinking process. And of course, um, I can also fix my mistakes. During my course, you can check all the information on the link below. We'll have a lot of things to learn. I don't analyze my games much, but I do analyze the games that uh, help me improve and raise uh, my rating from 2,000 up to 25,000. Uh, 2,500, I mean. <laughs> so that's all for this webinar. Uh, let me see if I can share my webcam once more. Let me see. OK, so that's all for this webinar. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you found this useful. And of course, I want to see you guys during my next videos and webinars. Thank you.